84, mid-career Murakami and the New York publishing biz. In San Francisco, in the Mission District, between 1993 and 1995, I read Haruki Murakami's A Wild Sheep Chase, Hard-Boiled Wonderland at the End of the World, The Wind-Up Bird Chronicle, and Norwegian Wood. He was then only recently translated into English and quite popular in San Francisco. Those early novels were unpredictable, well-crafted, and defied genre. Murakami's talking cats, imploding houses, slight shifts in perception of reality, and his cool character's natural acceptance of deep, scalar trips through levels of that reality became a genre of their own. His characters and prose paralleled in literature the malaise, disaffection, vapidity, and bored waiting game at the end of the 20th century, and then transcended it with fantastic departures from the world. The ride was like manga without the images, or a purely textual Miyazaki Hayao animation epic, just for single young adults. I first read A Wild Sheep Chase, Murakami's third novel written in 1982 in San Francisco when I was 25. It remains my favorite. I remember feeling incredibly small in the face of the universe as his characters were pushed around. I have a reverent fascination with Japan and a profound respect for her people. In my lifetime, time, Japan was the most Americanized among all Asian countries. So growing up in the US, I was allowed slightly greater exposure to her writers, say than the Chinese or the Koreans or even the Indians. Among Japanese novelists, I'd read Kawabata since I was a teenager and in university covered Mishima and Akutagawa. I hadn't yet read the post-war existentialists when I picked up Murakami. Banana Yamamoto's Kitchen was the hot new wave hitting California from the land of the rising sun. Murakami was immediately different. Pop synthesis of West and East through a contemporary urban Japanese sociocultural lens. Haruki Murakami began writing novels at the age of 29 in 1978 and has told Bomb magazine, quote, before that, I didn't write anything. I was just one of those ordinary people. I was running a jazz club and I didn't create anything at all, close quote. Wiki states he had a sudden epiphany during a baseball game. Quote, in 1978, Murakami was in Jingu Stadium watching a game between the Yakult Swallows and the Hiroshima Carp when Dave Hilton, an American, came to bat. In the instant that Hilton hit a double, Murakami suddenly realized that he could write a novel. He went home and began writing that night. Murakami worked on Hear the Wind Sing for several months in very brief stretches after working days at the bar. He completed the novel and sent it to the only literary contest that would accept a work of that length, winning first prize. Now, I'm 45, and Murakami's 65. This was written in 2012, so seven years ago, but uh, you get, you'll get the point. Now, I'm 45, and Murakami's 65, so we both remember 1984, the year in which his newest novel, 1Q84, is partially set. We have also both lived through an era that has seen the realization of some of the sociocultural horrors described in George Orwell's prophetic novel, 1984, which 1Q84 uses as a sort of launching point. My loudest use of Orwell's work was on the first anniversary of the September 11th attacks in 2002 as a performance element of the art installation Us Equals Them in Los Angeles. I read Orwell's 1984 aloud in its entirety in a bookstore gallery beginning at 535 in the morning, the time the first plane struck WCT2, and ending just as the sunset on the corner of Sunset and Alvarado. I printed slap tags that read 2002 equals 1984 and stuck them every place. I was excited to hear Murakami was using Orwell as a point of reference and assumed the work would have socio-political overtones. I hoped 
1Q84 would be more openly political and less personally intimate than the love stories he'd been writing. I consider Orwell to have been ahead of his time, so I was biased by the title's obvious reference. The particularly Asian coolness and practicality of Murakami's characters in everyday life is inspiring. But from the first, I felt his work was limited by the use of first-person narrative, usually with a narrative with a narrator who seemed very much like himself, a middle-aged Japanese man living in Tokyo and underwhelmed by normal existence. Murakami's male narrators, all roughly his age, made the work lightweight. His contemporaries in late 20th century fiction writing in and translated into English, Garcia Marquez, Echo, Kundera, Bowles, Ondaatje, Atwood, Boyle, Kureishi, Dalilo, Roth, Rushdie, Oates, Bolaño, they didn't succumb to this basic approach. As a writer, I'd come to the conclusion that my fiction suffered from my inability to write effectively in third person. I was biased by instructors and modernism away from the trend toward first person narratives written for the me generation. Murakami had no such bias, and neither, it turns out, did the publishing industry. Murakami was young when he began and was thrust into the international limelight very quickly because of the accessibility of his work and his remarkable imagination. He was rewarded for making it easy to read. He was rewarded immense audiences for his references to Western pop, to classical music, and to the boozy freedom of postmodern urbanity. Haruki Murakami's narrator's exceptional breaks from the normative were what thrilled. These crazy trips into the unreal experienced, on, experienced coolly by his characters. As a straight, booze-drinking, single urbanite in my 20s, pre-metrosexuals, Murakami's meals, drinks, and one-night stands were a blast. In some cases, a relief from the moralizing of political correctness. I have sometimes felt targeted by novelists. Some just succeed in getting it. I wouldn't discover Pepe Carvalho until a decade later, but Spanish readers will appreciate the comparison to Montalban. We used to joke about a drinking game in which you take a drink every time a Murakami character does. It gets harder to finish the book. I only begrudgingly got into Murakami's use of Western cultural tropes as described within an East Asian urban society, which Murakami was first to in terms of crossover, and which he uses abundantly like a signature. As an Indian living in the US and Asia who studied Ronald Takaki then, this was unappealing. I hated what post postmodernism was becoming, but by the late 90s, cross-hatching Asia and the West had flooded the field. Murakami and Jim Jarmusch and Quentin Tarantino and Miyazaki Hayao made it cool, sensible. At last, Asians outside London and New York were exhibiting what Hanif Qureshi knew and was called insouciant for writing. It was inevitable at the dawn of the internet and the globalizing 21st century. Haruki Murakami, the runner from the longest U.S. occupied part of Asia, Japan, the novice writing in Japanese first person about being single, urban, and sexually liberated was the first high-reaching Asian to just go ahead and run with it straight into the 21st century. I'm generalizing, but proposing Murakami was the best seller who embodied the literary trend toward first person narrative form and made it cool for Asian writing to love the West. Rushdie's ground beneath her feet must have been influenced in some small smart some small part by what Murakami was carving out, you know? Rushdie starts going and hanging out with Bono and you uh, too, you know? <laughs> Initially turned off by the brazen professing involved in it, I began to embrace Murakami's careful choices of European orchestral music and Western movies, TV shows and pop songs appropriated to both metaphorize, translate, and drive narrative on multiple tiers. But creatively, it always struck me as an easy way to force structure. I was least impressed by Norwegian Wood, 
It struck me as a soap opera written for a specific audience of romantics. So after finishing it, I passed on a few of Murakami's books and embarked on other pretty heavy post-war Japanese novels. Dazai Osamu, The Setting Sun and No Longer Human, Kobo Abe, The Woman in the Dunes, and Saiichi Maruya's contemporary classic, A Mature Woman. I returned to Murakami in 2005 with the publication of Kafka on the Shore, which was my summer read while living on a Japanese shore in Kamakura. Again, impressed by the proficiency with language, I liked the poetics and the magical, even spiritual feel, but I remained disappointed by what struck me as basically a first-person relationship story. Murakami was still pushing Western tropes through to the title page and writing less political, getting more pop. That's my experience with Murakami's work. I'm not qualified to review 1Q84 as anything other than a reader of novels for 30 years. I do not pretend to understand him as a man, nor have I read much about him or his method, barring what's been published in The New Yorker here and there. In some small part, this will also be a discussion of the state of the publishing industry in 2012, which has carefully produced Murakami, the technically proficient, edgy, yet non-threatening Asian romantic fantasist, into an internationally best-selling novelist. Though I've lived in Japan, I cannot read Japanese, and so have experienced all the Japanese novelists I've told you about only in translation to English. 1Q84, translated by J. Rubin and Philip Gabriel, was published by Knopf as a massive 944-page case-bound borzoi with a vellum slipcover designed by Chip Kidd that lightly masks close-ups of two Japanese faces, a female on the front and a male on the back, on October of 25th of last year, 2011, and sold for $30. I have a picture of it here on the site. I'll, I'll put this up on the um, as a link below. I found a copy in good condition for 18 bucks earlier this summer at one of the used bookstores I helped stay in existence, and I finished it last week. This is, again, a review from 2012 of 1Q84. The paperback and e-versions have been available for some time now, and I began to wonder whether this form of publication is ever really being read cover to cover. The thing is a doorstop, a bookcase brace, a coffee table weight, but reading it, it's awkward, heavy, and, and very hard to conceal. Lugging this anvil around the past few weeks, I was stopped and asked about it many times in the street. One guy stopped pedaling his bike going up a hill to stop me and ask, is that the new Murakami? Is it good? Waiters, bartenders, and waitresses at all my local coffee shops, bars, and restaurants asked and showed anticipatory excitement about this big, pretty-looking thing. I was sure the novel was being read, but figured the vast majority of that reading was happening in multiple parts as separate books in paperback or in a digital format. I've never wanted an e-reader more than in the past few weeks lugging around 1Q84 with its slippery vellum cover. Which brings us to the design by Chip Kidd and why it was sitting pretty, marked down 30% at the used bookstore within eight months of publication. On November 11th of last year, two weeks after its publication, Rachel Deal raved in Publishers Weekly, Knopf's, Knopf's high-end print package for 1Q84 pays off, quote, but Knopf, which published the title, late, the title late last month, has not only turned the book into a bestseller, it's also managed to reverse another trend. It has made the book more popular in print than in digital. According to numbers released by the publisher, the novel, which was at number two on the Times bestseller list in, on November 13th, has sold 75,000 copies in hardcover and 25,000 in digital. God, those numbers are so low in the modern era. In my lifetime, to hear 75,000 copies. Uh, sorry. Those impressive print sales are thanks in large part to an extravagant package that Knopf put together that has made the book the kind of object, beautiful and collectible, that readers want. And more than likely, non-readers also want. Close quote. The design is horrible. The lettering of the title is put on two lines so that the one Q is above the 84 
rather than written like a year, 1Q84. The result is that everyone who knows nothing about the book thinks its title is IQ84, which is hilarious and sad. The vellum cover and the bold sans serif font make it worse. It's so done already. The design completely fails to help make Murakami's connection between 1984 and 1Q84. Oddly, so does Murakami within, so perhaps it's a case of too good design. The faces on the cover aren't the author, but face models. And the vellum kid asked for, that's received so much praise, serves to mask their Japanese-ness while retaining the sexy. Fashion, haute couture. The end sheets and chapter title pages continue the idiocy of separating the numbers of the title out, making it more disassociated than ever from Orwell. These pages are all black and white photographic backdrops of twilight and of the moon, which plays a significant role in the book, but though highly stylized, they're cheaply produced, and the graphic elements aren't even like the descriptions by the author within, which are specific about the appearance of the moon. Design sensibility invades literature again. Ugh. It's whorish and stupid and has, and has received nothing but praise and exaltation for Knopf and Chip Kid for eight months. Quote, the kind of object beautiful and collectible that readers want and more than likely non-readers also want. <sighs> In the late 90s, when I was working as a low-wage proofreader, fact checker, jacket designer, and researcher in the New York publishing industry. While trying to get published myself, at nights and on the weekends, I also worked to help found a nonprofit artist's book organization in Brooklyn. It was bizarre. By day, I'd be using new digital tools to make mass-produced work flashier, more designed, more image-oriented, less text-heavy, while at night and on the weekends, I helped produce fine art books with traditional materials in limited edition. The turn of the millennium in New York City brought the consolidation of publishing and birthed, and birthed the end of the book as we know it. What happened with 1Q84 last year was that it was sold as a sculptural object to great success. They made it into something you could market at Xmas whether anyone read it or not. But appreciating the work within is made more difficult by the immense distraction of these new marketing methods, which crowd the work with the gushing sycophancy of non-readers buying sculpture. That's the end of part one of this uh, discussion of 1Q84 and uh, <clears throat> the New York publishing industry. Part two. 1Q84 is Murakami's first novel in third person. It succeeds in reaching for high ground, but weaknesses are revealed by the more difficult form. Some of these may be solely a result of translation issues, but for whatever made it happen, at points it's unbearable. 1Q84 is overwritten. It could easily be two-thirds the length. There may be perhaps no single person or department to blame for this. It could be issues of translation. Having two different translators may have contributed to the repetition of ideas as each attempted to infuse their read. Throughout the work, slipshod word choices are not just used, but repeated awkwardly. I hated the choice of the word jacket rather than sleeve for record covers. It isn't wrong, but it just sounds clunky in repetition. And the term is repeated within a paragraph without replacement when sleeve or cover would work so much better. The translation seemed rushed and simple. I presume this added pages. It could have been a bad editor at Knopf, unwilling or unable to realize that when you publish three books in the same series from another language into one book, sometimes there will be an absurd number of repetitions of basic points, because when the work was originally published, these points were repeated to bring in new readers at each stage of publication. I haven't read any other reviews of this book, but I gather from uh, the publisher's weekly clip that this was the New York Times' problem with the book. It could be the fault of Knopf itself, which seems to have rushed to shove the book out the door fast for Xmas season of last year, using cheap, 
flashy design to create a book to be sold as a sculptural object. They didn't care what was in it as much was as what was on it, what it looked and felt like. It could easily have been rushed for sales and cheated of the requisite time and effort required for editing and translation. These possibilities notwithstanding, the responsibility for quality of the work lies with the author. And Murakami's attempt at third person results in common problems for anyone embarking on the daunting task of writing a proper novel. You must get inside the characters to let them live, but you mustn't show you are inside the characters for them to live. One sophomoric method used to achieve this for several decades is italics to represent the thoughts and inner monologues of a character. If it absolutely has to be done, then this is the accepted practice. Okay, this is in, next part is in italics. Oh, I'm getting pedantic. I hope they'll understand what I mean, that you should be able to write your characters into what you're trying to convey and not have to rely on italicized font to tell the reader something important. Oh, maybe I'm just nitpicking. MT, you're such an oppressive rationalist. That's all in in uh, ITAL, right? So it's like in my head as opposed to being what you read. But just like the flashback has become nauseatingly common to drive narrative in movies since Pulp Fiction, usage of italicized thoughts has become standard in novels in third person in this, the era of the first person narrative. It's a failure on the writer's part, or at least a CYA move. If you have to do it as a writer, you make it count. Not so in 1Q84. Murakami's discomfort with the form leads to an unending parade of italicized thoughts. No character goes mentally uninvaded. Like the first person narrative before, Murakami is shaking off rules again in this attempt at third person narrative. This could be considered bold, I suppose, but not by me. What was bold was the whole new dimension added when Murakami decided to have these characters thinking in italics about quotes. These sections are actually italicized and bolded. <laughs> so the characters thinking about a quote, I don't mean once or twice at climactic moments, but throughout the entire novel, nearly every character. Murakami has characters read a number of different texts, texts aloud to each other. This in and of itself is bizarre because references to existing texts like Chekhov could have been made off the page rather than being read aloud between two characters. The point of using the Chekhov could have been made in action or through literary tactics, leaving the text itself as a support floating in literary space. In some cases, these nonfiction texts are literally the full repetition of historical data as bedtime stories in the book, simply so they can be referred to in future chapters. Clunky. It's also demeaning to readers. In the case of notes read aloud between and within the minds of characters, Murakami doesn't even let the note exist as the exchange. The note is quoted by a character within his or her own thoughts. Murakami and the translators use bold text within the italicized thoughts to display the character working out the meaning in their own thoughts. It's either genius beyond me or annoying filler because you can't convey what you mean. The repetitions continue, almost as though when occupying one character or another, Murakami has forgotten that another character has made a point, and so he repeats that point. At first, I thought this was because the book, like works of Murakami's in the past, was going to get fantastically multi-layered and these would echo, but that never happens. It's just repetitive. 1Q84 is also a little predictable, despite its imaginative elements. I saw the intersection of the lead characters Tengo and Aomame coming long before it was clear they were intertwined. I wondered if Tengo was authoring Aomame into existence so I could see clearly through to Murakami himself. I lay all this at the feet of the shift to the third person narrative. It's hard to do. That is why I think Murakami is at mid-career despite having written so many novels and achieving such success. Murakami strikes me as a hardworking perfectionist who will likely tackle third-person narrative form again, rather than shy away from it after a first-rate attempt. I look forward to his progress, and as usual, will be among the millions reading his flights of fancy. I enjoy Murakami's precise technical prose, like describing a meal or a piece of music. I admire what he does well, creating translucent, shimmering waves of realities that both define and filter how his characters perceive of reality. I enjoy his detailed descriptions of events of the past, like war and post-war 
conditions, laden with contemporary attitudes about these events. Certain simplicities like descriptions of the natural world, Murakami just nails. His cicadas take me to uh, Japan in summer. Haruki Murakami continues to display a bright, brilliant imagination and wild ideas. Haruki Murakami continues to display a brilliant imagination and wild ideas. He weaves his plot streams together beautifully. Though some of the unpredictability, unpredictability has gone as a result of our familiarity with his tactics, Murakami has invaded our consciousness with his genre. Unfortunately, 1Q84 as it stands is too long, in parts very repetitious, somewhat clunk clunky, and as a result, boring. I give it a 3 out of 5. <laughs>